morning and welcome to a chilly Juma private game reserve. My name is Brent Yeosmith. I have Brian Jubey on camera. And for the first time in many weeks, the Killer Bees are reunited. And of course, the thumb who's actually controlling the camera and Brian. Uh, we're on our way to where Karula had her kill uh, on the Sunset Safari. I have heard that people have checked already and it looks like hyenas stole that kill overnight. So we are going to go keep and have a check for tracks in the area uh, to see if she possibly came across to the north to visit us on Juma. But this is Safari Live and of course the live part of Safari means we are on a live African Safari and we are in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve South Africa. Uh, particularly on Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains. And at the moment we're going to be working around Juma, seeing if we can find any tracks of Karula, the dominant female leopard in this area, or often referred to as the queen of Juma. And uh, she has two young cubs at the moment, about five months old. So very exciting. Hopefully she has decided to come to the, the north now also, if you want to ask me a question, feel free, or Jamie a question for that matter, uh, to do it by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, um, or send an email to questions at wildearth.tv. So it's Jamie and Jandre out on Maggie the Mahindra, and in final control, I'm not actually sure, I saw all three final control ladies up this morning, so there's a, a combination of Kirsten, Louise, Oh, it is Kirsten and Louise, and they'll be fielding your questions and sending them through to us out on the drive. Ooh. What do we have there? No, those are hyena tracks. I think those are the same culprits that stole Karula's kill. Now, where she killed that adult male impala is not a good spot. So hyenas and lions both like to use main roads like this as highways, and the kill was right next to that main road. And it's about 12 degrees Celsius, uh, which is 52 or 53 Fahrenheit. So it's quite chilly well, for us <clears throat> soft nor uh, southern hemisphere people. Brian, have you got any tracks going down Leadwood there? Doesn't look out of Leadwood. That was um, where we found her yesterday at the beginning. So no tracks yet. Hello Victoria, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Uh, Victoria would like to know what is the best time to see animals? Well Victoria, that would be now and uh, in the early morning and the late afternoon is the best time and that's why we on drive at those particular times because it is the best time to see animals. Now, just checking very carefully for tracks. I have my cup of tea because it's very cold. I have Earl, Earl Grey this morning. Feeling very, very posh. Okay, here's a, a good spot to check for tracks. So we're very close to the area where she is now. Judging from the hyena tracks, I'm, I've got some... Oh, here are the cub tracks. I think this is her bringing them back to the kill, so let's just go forward a bit. And I said, unfortunately, the hyenas have walked down this main road and the kill was off to the south. So there's a strong possibility they've chased her to the south. Um, but there's a nice little river system here that she might utilize. Yep, let's just say good morning. Morning, Jan. How are you this morning? Cold. <laughs> well, we're just going to jump across to Jamie while I have a quick chat with Jan so we can catch up and try to figure out where the Queen of Doom has gone. Good morning and welcome on our sunrise safari. I'm heading out. My name is Jamie and I have... Oh, 
Jandre on camera with me and I feel as though Jandre and I need a name like the Killer Bees. We're both J. So the Killer Js doesn't really work. In fact, the Killer Js sounds rather terrifying. We sound like a, 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 some, a pair that's gone on a crime spree or something similar. <coughs> well, I have devastating news, just as you see me pulling Maggie the Mahindra out of low range. The hyena den. We paid a quick visit and all was very, very quiet. And in fact, Gwen or some hyenas' tracks go right past it from the DRC where they started out, obviously having a sniff around to see if they could find anything. And then along the road and straight up Gallagher shortcuts. So no sign of any hyenas, no sound of any lions. Where well, we're going to go and check Buffles Hook Dam and where they were yesterday just to see if they're still around. Oh, I've got to be careful. I nearly pressed the, the horn on Maggie the makeshift Mahindra. As of course you may have guessed, James broke Wendy. Well, I'm not sure James broke Wendy. I don't know if that's entirely fair. It was James. Jandre says it was James. Jandre would know. Jandre, were you on camera with James? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gary would like to know if there is a, perhaps a connection. There's lots of hyena tracks here, by the way, which is very, very positive because there's lots of big tracks and lots of little tracks which suggests that it is not just Gwen anymore and perhaps our lovely hyena clan has decided to come back and pay us a visit because their tracks are absolutely everywhere here. Now it's just a matter of figuring out where they are. Gary, yes, absolutely, 100% it has to do with increased cat sightings and the occasional bush bashing. In fact, that was what got Rusty's fan, I believe. There was a very large zebra wood by his own confession, James found a very large, very solid, very spiky zebra wood and he accidentally drove over it and that um, did, did a little bit of damage. Mostly though, if you think about what, what, how hard our cars work, our vehicles work, twice a day, and it's not for three hours, it's not for the, just for the portion of the show that you see, we've got to get places, we've got to get back, so it's basically eight hours a day on terrain that I wouldn't describe as easy. It's not your average drive down a suburban road. And then if you calculate the fact that Wendy is almost as old as I am, as is Jigger, as is Rusty, a little bit younger, but I mean, they're, they're reaching their sort of 20s. They're no longer teenagers. And you get an idea of just how much they are struggling. Not struggling, they'll be absolutely fine. But things break, it's just the way of things. A vehicle is what, it's what happens to vehicles out here. We haven't even had any wild dog chases for a long time, Gary. So, I don't know, it's a combination of things. Wendy's slave cylinder did break a while ago. Remember when I was trying to change gear and I couldn't? And we knew that she'd blown a seal there. It was replaced, but something else has gone horribly wrong with her clutch. That's just the way of things. But that's okay, because Maggie, the makeshift Mahindra, is out and about. And to move on to a different subject, which is what I'm currently splitting my brain thinking about, trying to work out where these hyenas are, Red Red Dog, in terms of how old hyena cubs are when they go to a kill, there's some very interesting research that suggests that that age varies depending on whether the mother is high ranking or low ranking. Now what I mean by that, because a hyena cub is going to start nibbling on meat at around uh, roughly six months old, sometimes older, sometimes younger. Only the high ranking females bring food back to the den from what research has shown. So, Madam, Pretty, Corky, they all bring food back to the den site itself, especially Madam, we've seen her do it a couple of times. So that means that their cubs don't run the risk of going to kills at an early age. That combined with the fact that they have better access to food and therefore can afford the, the resources to lactate for longer, means that there's a general skew in favour of the survival of cubs born to high-ranking females. The lower ranking females have to start getting their cubs out sooner 
because they need them to accompany them to the kills. They can't bring the kill back to the den site. And even if they did, if there were any high-ranking females with cubs there, they wouldn't get a nose in to feed on the kill. The high-ranking females and cubs would just push them out of the way. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of variation there in terms of the weaning age of hyenas. It's nothing like leopards or lions where they have a relatively well-established age at which they start to eat meat and then they stop suckling. And it's interesting that we've got all of our little, I mean, some of those hyena tracks are yay big. So it means that, that I saw on that road. So that means that there are the younger ones, probably our December, November, January. Looks like they might have been in the area. I'm trying to show you some very cold looking impala. How's your view there, Jandre? I'm still getting to grips with Maggie the makeshift Mahindra's angles. Some very red impala, all fluffed up in the chilly morning air. Not that we can complain, it's really not that bad. We have definitely experienced far worse. Although I say that from the relative safety of the, the insides of Maggie the Mahindra, and, and I basically disappear underneath the dashboard in this vehicle. Jandre has to deal with most of the, the wind chill factor. Okay. Definitely not the best sighting of Impala we've ever had. Most of them moving off into the bush. Oh, there was a little bit of a hop, skip and jump there. Still a little bit hormonal. There we go, we have a suggestion from Leah, who is nine years old and is in Florida. Hello Leah, good morning, and well, it's not good morning for you, but good morning anyway and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Thank you for that. Leah has provided us with a name. She's called us the Mockingjays. There we go, Jandre. We are now the Mockingjays. Leah, you're actually thinking along the same lines as Jandre was thinking earlier this morning. Jandre also suggested the Mockingjays. So the Mockingjays it is. I'm not sure what we're mocking just yet. But we'll have to try and find uh, the, our South African equivalent of a Mockingjay. Jen B says the Jazzy Jays. Yes, Jandre? No. <laughs> Jen B, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that Jandre feels feels jazzy. Do you feel jazzy this morning? Jubilant. Jubilant. The Jubilant Jays. Trying to look. I, my mind's gone completely blank. I think mocking Jays is probably a good one. We can mock. I don't know what we're going to mock. We'll mock something. We'll mock Kirsty. That's what we'll do. Kirsty, of course, being our lovely director. <laughs> she says thank you. <laughs> on this chilly Sunday morning, I believe it's Sunday. Oh, on the subject of Sunday, don't forget about fireside chat this evening, which we will be doing in the usual fireside chat style. Who knows, James Hendry might even be convinced to play his guitar. I'm sure we could twist his arm to get him to perform a lovely song for you. And we've got all kinds of marvellous things to talk about because we've been so incredibly fortunate over the last few days. Now, I even got to see a leopard that I've never seen before yesterday morning on the Sunrise Safari. And that was quarantine, watching an entire herd of elephants walk up to three in a row plan on Cheetah Plains. Hmm. Somebody with very big feet walked down this road, very big paws, but uh, probably about two days ago. Oh, those are not fresh tracks at all, unlike our hyena tracks that are absolutely everywhere. Now, I'm sure you're all very curious as to how, just speaking of tracks, how Brent's tracking is working out for him. Let's head across onto the back of Rusty and find out. Well, unfortunately, no tracks of the Queen head north. So it looks like, as I suspected, those hyenas would have come from the main road and chased her south. So we're gonna go have a look, see if we can find any sign of the lions from last night. And I will be keeping my ear to the radio, see if there's any updates 
from down the Cheetah Plains area. Although I think I haven't been to Arethusa since I've been back, so maybe a little meander to Arethus might be worth our while. And you have a little bachelor group of wildly beasts hiding in the thicket there. Um, how's that, Brian? I think that's about the best we're going to get. There. Hello, Gnu. They are such incredibly funny looking creatures. I mean, even though they look like a cow, they are not. They're an antelope. Gnu. And that's where that name Gnu comes from. So when they communicate, and especially when they're in big herds, you hear them, they go Gnu, Gnu, Gnu. Now, the name Wildebeest uh, is originally from Dutch and it basically translates to wild cow. And when the first Dutch settlers arrived in the Western Cape around Cape Town, there would have been wildebeest on the plains in that area. And I think it's possibly one of the first animals uh, the European or well, the Dutch European settlers saw out on the plains and probably at a bit of a distance and it does look a little bit like a cow. So I think that's where the name the wildebeest comes from and a wild beast or <laughs> a wild cow. There you go, crossing the road. So this is a little bachelor group. Oh, hang on, I just heard something. Hang on a second, guys. Sorry, I just got to be on the radio. F, what you got there? Copy, I'm on Cheetah Cut Line. Um, do you think I've got enough time to get there before she crosses north? Okay, hold on. We're going to turn around um, because there is a leopard. And I'm going to have to speed because she's going to cross out of our traverse area. And while I speed, let's go across to Jamie quickly so I can concentrate on not wrapping ourselves around a tree. Well, I suppose that's a very good thing to concentrate on, not wrapping oneself around a tree. Um, We've, we've all had the occasional bump on the side of the vehicle. Scott, of course, I think wins the crashing into the trees. Um, Scott, who was a previous presenter here, he left us a couple of months ago to head to interesting places. Um, Scott was once looking for a lilac breasted roller whilst live. And he was driving, looking, 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 and he bashed into a marula tree. And that remains to me one of the funniest things that has ever happened on live, just because of the sheer expression of surprise on his face. There's two reasons why I am sort of coasting along. One is that there's lion tracks absolutely everywhere around me. Two is that they're very fresh. And three, I'm running the risk of going into a bad signal area and I want to give Brent a chance to get to those leopards. I'm also trying to work out, because the lions are pacing up and down, trying to work out which way was their last direction that they picked. I think, it's the, I think they're now heading, looks like they might be heading to the east. Hello to secret agent Siamese, who is a new viewer and would like to know if this is in Africa. Yes, we are indeed in Africa. We are in the southern portion of Africa, South Africa to be exact. I always feel as though South Africa, on the one hand it's a cool name, on the other hand it's kind of, it's, not, it's sort of a bit obvious, isn't it? The country that's in the southernmost point of Africa. Yes, I don't know whether you've ever heard of the famous Kruger National Park. That is about <coughs> five miles in that general direction, the beautiful direction of the sunrise that is half-heartedly occurring behind the clouds. 
We are on Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains game reserve in the Sabi Sands and I've stopped with somebody behind me looking terribly annoyed. Sorry, Tax! <laughs> So good morning to you. You are on a live safari, obviously, since I just answered your question. We are in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area. So it's open to about 4 million hectares or 8.5 million acres of wilderness area. Good morning. You think those Ngala and Kunzo are not so fresh back there? Yeah, last night the guys are just following them. They said I can't search in the sea or in the sea. Where did you come from this time? Come from Galago Shortcut. No Nkonzo, they're nothing but me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that way. No. Okay, we'll go, we'll come help you. What's your route from here, Tax? I'll go straight along the path. Okay, copy. I'll take Gary Cut Line. Cool. Okay, just planning out a route, obviously as this is the Sabi Sands, to get back to our introduction to our live safaris, it means that there are also guests here that go out on a real life safari. We've got the next best thing, which is our live safaris. And because it's live and interactive and goes on for every day, twice a day, it means that our animals become incredibly well known. We become incredibly with, familiar with them. We have lions that we know very very well we have leopards that we know very very well and we can actually follow their stories throughout their lives now Brad started off the morning looking for a leopard known as Karula, the queen of juma he's now racing towards the sighting of her oldest daughter or perhaps she's got a twin daughters that are coming up to 10 years old um hopefully he will be able to find her for you before she disappears off the traverse Closer and closer, black hole. Just find something else to show you. Perhaps a nice lion track. Never mind, Brent has got the leopard. Look, through the bush we can just make out Tandy crossing into Torchwood. Now there's some Impala just to my left. So I think there might be, oh no, she might come up towards oh no she's heading further almost straight west but there's some there's some parlor herd do you still see it brian oh well done brian great camera work Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to decide now. I just want to watch the other vehicles. If she comes around, we might be in a good spot sitting here. Morning, morning. How are you this morning, for? Cold. Can't you do I think Kurula went south, eh? There's no tracks coming north. Nisi Tosha. Sorry guys, I'm just having a quick chat. Has no one gone to Cheetah Plains? I think I might go there if no one's there. <laughs> morning, morning. Um, the Nkomas... The Nkomas and one Birmingham are still out by Bavuzuk boundary. Come on. Okay, enjoy. Okay, so guys, uh, as we said, Tandy, we just got the most brief of brief visuals. And I'm trying to think now. I can't see where the vehicles are going, but the Impala I was talking about, that she was jogging because of, there could be more lower down, are just opposite us. So there we go, you can see the herd of Impala there through the bush. But I think we're going to continue on. Um, there we go. She's, she's carried on north, so maybe she's seen other impala that we can't see. 
Uh, we're gonna, I think since we're here, we might as well go check Cheetah Plains. It sounds like no one is there and there's a, a lack of water around. So maybe Mr. Q's come back to three in a row pan or maybe we'll get lucky within Kanyeni. But I am gonna lose signal as I dip through here. So unfortunately, oh wait. Sorry, just, I just heard something. One of the Impala started looking quite alert, but no. I can hear where the vehicles are following her. So we're going to leave, I said we're going to head towards Cheetah Plains, but um, Jamie has got the only animal out here that can compete with Brian my so and myself's manes. So let's go see what it is. <laughs> and Jandre. Jandre also has a mane. <laughs> we have a wonderful surprise for you this morning and he's actually calling. So I'm just going to be quiet for one moment. to see if he does it again. It was one of those half-hearted, hmm, exhausted kind of noises. Oh no, not that way, boy. Okay, life's about to get a bit tricky. I don't know that we're going to be able to follow him. Hopefully he decides to lie down. Who have we got here? Right, if this is your first time on our live safari, as we know it is for at least one person, this is one of the dominant males of the area, a Birmingham boy, and he's about to make my life incredibly difficult by going into the, or off the road. I'm hoping he's going to keep on south. How's your view? Uh, okay. I would like to be able to call this in. Unfortunately, the, the other guys are busy chatting about other things, just because I think I'm going to need some help to keep up with him as he goes into the block between Gowrie Cut Line and Mvubu Road. Stations one Ngalo mobile to the west from Gowrie Cut Line towards Mvubu Road. Oh, I got a full whiff of that smell. You saw he urinated on the bush there. Scent marking and the smell, the wind's blowing it straight towards us, so we've got a very clear smell of fresh lion urine. Okay, let's give this a go. I cannot guarantee that we are going to be able to stay with him, just because in Maggie, the makeshift Mahindra, everything's slightly more difficult. So let us try. Here's a good way in. I'm not even sure that's a good way in. But we're gonna try it. Come on, Maggie, show us what you can do sort of brings us back to Gary's point from the start of the Sunrise Safari. Oh, everybody watch heads. And eyes and all extremities. I want to try and stay with him because I think the other lions are somewhere in this block and I think he's going to go and try and meet up with them. Uh, where to next? This way. Everybody look out for good places for us to drive. <laughs> Go, Maggie. Show us what you could do, Maggie. Well done, Maggie. Oh, he's doing a bit of yoga. That long-limbed cat stretch. 
he is still on the move. And guys, I do apologise for the open game drive comms. Obviously, with Maggie, the makeshift Mahindra, we have to be constantly listening to the game drive channel in order to be able to make sure we don't miss any exciting updates. No, usually, that the conversation is happening in our ears, but we can't do that on Maggie. Right, we better not let, get, let him get too far ahead of us, and we're going to wind up with a problem. Joey is wondering about our olfactory update for the morning, having just smelt our lion's fresh urine smell, and we're about to smell it again here, because he did mark this apple leaf. Come on, Maggie, come on, Maggie, come on, Maggie. Yay. Okay. Can we do this? Yes, we can. Of course we can. We're going to get covered in lion spray. Oh, gross. Sorry, Jandre. <laughs> We're going to smell like lion for the rest of the day. So, Mag uh, Joey, not Maggie, sorry, that's the Mahindra. Joey, lion urine smells a bit like very strong cat urine. Very, very pungent. But is it true that leopard urine smells like butter popcorn? Yes, apparently to everybody but me. So I don't smell it, personally. I, I don't, somehow there's something in my brain that doesn't interpret the smell that way. Oh, he's getting very far ahead of us. Come on, Maggie. I don't smell it that way. I smell it as just urine. Everybody duck. Oh, there's a lot of stumps here. Come on, Maggie. You can do it, Maggie. Need to up the pace a bit or we're going to lose him. Oh no. Oh no. Round we go. Are we going to make this, Chandra, with the antenna? Well done. Joey, I think leopard urine smells like cat urine, but apparently to everybody else in the great wide world, it smells to them like buttered popcorn. I don't know what it is about my brain that doesn't interpret that smell that way, but such as it is, I don't feel that it is. That's the way it smells. Oh, good. Oh, no. Oh, no, not the monkey orange thicket. We can't. We, we can't. Hint of paprika. Pardon? Hint of paprika. Ah, hint of paprika. That Jandre smells. Goodness, that's very, that's very specific, Jandre. <laughs> I am um, I'm not sure I would agree with Jandre, but he may well be correct. My sense of smell, especially this morning, having suffering a little bit from the dust. I could barely smell everything. Where are you going, boy? Okay guys, just a quick update for new viewers. <sighs> As we drive through the trees, everybody duck. Um, no, no, we can't lose him. We can't lose him. We have to go around. Um, as we drive through the trees, just to let you know, we pick the tree species that it is okay to drive over. They are young saplings that spring back up, or they are invasive tree species that are bush, bush encroachers. Not bush encroachers. Ah! ah! Attack! Attack from every side! Attack! Watch out, Jandre! Oh no! Oh no! He's gonna pop out on Vubu Road now, and I'm gonna feel very silly. Side mirrors are very silly. Okay, Brent is up and running on Cheetah Plains. I need to concentrate, obviously, because things are a bit tricky right now. So let's go over to him. Maggie Mahindra is not the most maneuverable vehicle in our fleet. So let's let Jamie concentrate. We've now 
made, oh wait, let me just turn that down, to cheetah plans. And I'm hoping for quarantine, but I'm also hoping for cheetah. So we're just gonna go very, very slowly. Have a look what's happening down here. And I'm always very excited when I learn that we are the only car on the whole of cheetah plans. And that we are this morning. So very exciting. Uh, we have the whole wilderness area of Cheetah Plains to ourselves and hopefully it won't disappoint. It definitely hasn't been disappointing in the last few days. We've had some fantastic sightings here. Let's have a quick look at the road junction for tracks. A very warm safari live. Welcome to Yankee Girl, who's a new viewer. Welcome to the family. Uh, Yankee Girl would like to know, do we get meerkats in the reserve? Unfortunately not. Meerkats are, sorry, I'm just checking that tree. Thought I saw it. Very solid shape in the middle of it. That big tree right at the back there, Brian. Let's have a look with the camera. Now it always pays to double check these things. I don't think it's anything, but you never know, there might be a leopard hiding. But in this case, I'm afraid not. But uh, meerkats live in the more arid areas of South Africa, so they're more of a desert and semi-desert species. Uh, what we are in is mixed woodland and grassland. So the closest meerkat to here is a couple of hundred kilometers uh, away. But the say we have two different species that fill a similar ecological niche in this ecosystem, and that are mongooses, which are related to meerkats, of course, very distantly. And it's the dwarf mongoose and the banded mongoose are the two mongoose species that fulfill the same sort of ecological niche to the meerkat out here in the low fault of South Africa. Okay, so no sign of any tracks yet, but we are in the middle of a drought, so we are gonna check the water holes first. And there's a bit of cloud cover moving in from the east. Now, my favorite sport is a sport called rugby. And some of you might know what it is, some of you might not. So, oh, beautiful big herd of impala. Last night, I was watching some rugby that was being played on the east coast of South Africa and there was a lot of rain. So this could be the tail of that coal front that's coming through. Hello, little boy. You can see that's a little male with impala, only the males have horns. And can you believe he was born probably sometime between November and January. And so he's not even a year old. And there's a little female of about the same age, that one there. And just to her left is an adult female. And you can see they're all very, very puffed up and reddish this morning. And that's very common with all the animals out here when it's a very cold morning. They puff up their skin, they catch a layer of air between their, their fur and their skin. Oh, 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 spasm, spasm. <laughs> that was quite funny. <laughs> yes, I, I'm sure we can all relate to that. As you, you get out in the morning and you've got a funny limb or whatnot and just kick it, loosen it up. There we go, you can see the difference between an adult female and a young female there perfectly. And as I was saying, that raised fur catches a sort of a layer of air between their skin and their, and, 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 the, and the hair follicles and it creates a sort of insulative blanket for them. Whew. 
incredibly alert animals in Pala. You have to be when lots of different things eat you there. Eaten by lion, leopard, wild dog, cheetah, hyena. So it pays to keep your eyes and ears open. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Let the impalas have their breakfast. Now, a very good morning to Karen. And Karen is wondering, do we ever burn the grass in seasons like this, like they do in the Serengeti, to produce more fresh grass? Now, we're a very different ecosystem from the Serengeti. And, but in the, in the larger sense, yes, we do burn, uh, Karen. This year, we will not burn. Uh, firstly, if we burnt, there would be almost no food for the animals. Uh, and secondly, we would battle to burn because there's no grass to burn. Uh, in this drought, you need grass to burn. Now, the majority of Africa, outside the true desert areas, and, sorry, I'm just checking traps here, Karen. Um, outside the true desert areas and the tropical rainforests, uh, Africa is a fire climax biome. And what that means is it actually needs fire. Certain areas need more fire than others, and the Serengeti is one of those. Now, we only have one rainy season a year. The Serengeti has two. So they have the big rains and the small rains, and we only have the one rains. Uh, we're a far more arid area than the Serengeti, but in a year like this, there's no grass to actually burn. But what burning does is it stimulates m the majority of the grass species to actually grow. So the growing points for grass are actually under the ground. So driving over grass and all that, you don't actually damage any of the growing points. Now, and oh, let's just check, sorry, I just want to make sure we don't miss any tracks at the junctions. Now, as I was saying, so the other thing it does, it removes a lot of dead branches, leaf litter, anything that might impede the grass from coming up. Uh, it also adds a lot of nitrates to the soil uh, and helps re-fertilize the soil. A lot of carbon is put back. Uh, it's, uh, fire is a very, very important thing in Africa and uh, for many hundreds of thousands of years fire was controlled at complete random by a strike of lightning or something like that. But as man mastered fire um, with our superior brain size, we noticed that after a lightning strike in the grass was burnt and you get a little bit of dew or a bit of rain, suddenly you have this great green flush and it brings a lot of animals onto it. So, when it, And then from then, once man sort of realized that, or our early ancestors realized that, uh, fire became a very important tool in the shaping of Africa. And people have shaped a lot of the open areas and plains of Africa and, and even areas like this with fire for easily 200, 300,000 years. So, a lot of times, uh, a, a lot of people think we are removed from the ecosystem, but we are and have been an integral part, uh, but I suppose on evolutionary terms, not very much so. It's a very short sort of split second in the history of the Earth, uh, the Earth being 4.2 billion years old. Uh, but so we have had an effect on the landscape. Now, there's very few animals that can affect the landscape. Uh, we are one, and uh, buffalo and elephant are the other two that are, are, are great changes of landscape in this ecosystem. In other ecosystems, you, you have other species that, that will ha make a big change on the ecosystem, and those are hippopotamuses, but those are in big swampy areas like the Okavango Delta and the Sud, which is a large swamp on the Nile River in Sudan. Hippos keep channels open, they stop the papyrus from clogging, they keep the water flowing. So these are the sort of main species that can completely change an ecosystem. And, oh, and, and some of the predators, especially your big predators like lions, are also one of those, those species. Now, don't really have a good example of it in Africa, but uh, in, the, in, in, in North America, there's an absolutely amazing example of it in, in Yellowstone National Park. 
is the reintroduction of wolves completely changed the ecosystem because the elk on the top of those seep lines and little, little beginnings of streams used to lie in there and basically stop the flow of water uh, getting down to the, the bigger areas. But with the reintroduction of, of, of wolves that kept the elk moving and whatnot and actually started causing the rivers to flow again. So you never know if you take any species out of an ecosystem, it could have a massive effect on the greater system. Now, this is the only water around for quite some way. That's why we're checking around here. This is three in a row pan. So far, I don't have any tracks. The only resident of three in a row pan at the moment. Oh, has taken off. <laughs> Was a blacksmith lapwing. Uh, there's another one on that side there. Oh, it's going to land that side as well. And these are birds that are associated with water. A little bit to the right, Brian. There's one in the open. To the right slightly. Just keep uh, same same angle. Just pan right. And stop. There we go. There you go, a little blacksmith lapwing. Now, certain lapwings, we find them quite often in the open, open grasslands, but this particular lapwing uh, will always, almost always be found around water. So, a little pair of them here, and they'll be pretty much resident in this area. Now, they get their name from the sound they make, it sounds like a blacksmith hammer tinking on metal. They're not really making too much noise at the moment. They're searching around for a, a snack. Oh, what's in front there? Ah, uh, Cape Turtle Dove as well. Get that dust out of the air. Oh, off it goes. There we go, dink, dink. Oh, looks like that's a better area to look for a meal. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so I'll let the blacksmith lapwing continue its search for morsels on the short grass area around three in a row pan. Uh, Christy's wondering, what is the chance of us seeing a female cheetah? Well, as good as any, uh, I have found female cheetah tracks a few times. Uh, now, a female cheetah will have a far more massive home range. They don't really have a set territory like the males, and they'll move in that area. The only time they really become stationary in an area for a long time is when they have cubs. Now, cheetah are very, very interesting in terms of big cats is the fact that they are the only cat species that needs a male uh, population bias to breed. Now, when I say a male population bias, it needs to be more males than females for them to successfully breed. And a female cheetah will often pass up three to four male coalitions before choosing one to mate with. So having multiple male coalitions in the area she wonders actually stimulates uh, her ovulation. That's one of the problems with cheetah and why they are an endangered species. They're, they're quite a lot of problems, but that is just one of the many. And so every other cat needs a, a, f a female dominant bias. So you'll have a male leopard, you'll have multiple females within his, in his territory. And Lions will be the same, will be a coalition of males and multiple female prides, but with cheetah, it's the opposite and it's the only big cat that operates like that. So the chief female cheetah might be around. I have seen one since I've been here, but I was out on tracking team and she was obviously coming from the Kruger somewhere where she hasn't seen cars and she skedaddled at a rate of knots 
at the first sign of a vehicle. But who knows, maybe our luck is on and uh, when we move towards the open plains, we might get lucky enough to see one. So while we make our way towards those said open plains, uh, let's go see what Jamie's been up to. Jamie's been attempting to relocate those lions for you. Oh, by the way, there were two. There was a lady with him, or at least a lady walking ahead of him, hence his determined stride in the direction that he was heading. And we just caught a very brief glimpse of her before both of them went where no Mahindra has dared to follow or will dare to follow under my watch. I just couldn't begin to think about coaxing poor Maggie through the patches of strychnos that we were about to encounter. So unfortunately, we had to leave our lions. And I've been sitting sort of roughly in the direction that they were walking in the hope that alarm calls might... Oh, goodness, sorry, Jandre, I nearly threw you off the back there. Uh, I was hoping that we might be able to hear some alarm calls, maybe start moving in that direction. But so far, all is quiet, and that's because this block is so incredibly thick that, the su that I don't think they would be visible unless they were right on top of something. Unless they have a kill in there, in which case it might be worth heading further in. And just bear with me one moment. Mike would like to chat to me. I'm sure he's interested in these lines, and of course I have to be the bearer of bad news. Standing by Mike. Morning, Jamie. Um, I'm just uh, heading towards Wilbur Road. Uh, is that my um, correct uh, direction if I want to boogie these in Gala? <laughs> That's a fair bit of Mike. You can take Wilbur Road and then turn <laughs> east into that block and see if you can find them, because I'm sorry I've lost them. Uh, okay, copy that. All right, I'll head that way. Thank you, Jamie. All good, come Okay. He's telling Mike that unfortunately this this particular what we call a block it's the the patch of bush between four roads um, this particular one is renowned for being incredibly difficult to follow up upon and we're just going to gently and quietly not so quietly do another loop of the area see if maybe they've popped out now we might not have the lions, but issuing forth from my vocal cords every now and again was turning this vehicle occasionally results in almost a lion impression, sort of that mm, as you try and turn the steering wheel. And Natasha thinks that that was Blondie. I, I, I will take your word for it, absolutely. I barely had a chance to look at him. I was concentrating on not, as Brent termed it, wrapping ourselves around a tree. So I will absolutely take your word for it, Natasha. I don't know who the female was because all I saw of her was her retreating tail into the nightmare forest of Strychnos that is in the middle of this block. Oh, and we still, I've still got a sort of pervading sense of smell that is wafting lion urine in our direction. I don't know if you're getting that, Jandre. Yeah, no, we, we definitely now, Maggie the Mahindra now smells a little bit like lion territorial urine spray, which is most pleasant. Gently wafting in our direction. And there's no getting away from it because the front bumper hit it first. So unless I do the entire drive in reverse, we are going to be surrounded by this smell. Okay. No tracks coming out. No lions coming out. They might have just decided to lie down, as lions do. When they get tired of walking in one direction, they lie down for a while and they get up and carry on. But we're not giving up hope just yet. The, the alternative, of course, is that they've got a kill. Apparently, we were speaking to Taxon. You were with us when we were speaking to Taxon about the fact that they were seen in that area last night. And it's a perfect hunting area. It's where the, exactly where, those Nkuhuma lionesses lost their buffalo kill to the hyenas in the middle of June. And that's exactly where they are. And I wonder whether or not they haven't managed to catch another buffalo. There were buffalo in there when we were driving through.
They could also be a courting pair. There's certainly been a great deal of that over the last two weeks. Melanie, how does the male pick which female to mate with? It's um, pure proximity, essentially. So if there is a lioness in estrus, the one closest to him gets mated with. Um, and she often does a lot of the work. She'll do the approaching, she'll do the courting. So it's not so much a, a decision as the decision is made for them. Okay, just trying to think about what we're going to do. I'm thinking perhaps it might be worth moving into the block where we had, where we made a road. That might be the next step if they haven't popped out. I just want to speak to Mike quickly. I want to find out what his route is. Mike, what's your route from Mvuru Road? Oh, no, that's not what I meant to ask him at all. I'm still on uh, Bufflesook cut line, but, um, yeah, I'm turning from Bufflesook, uh, the, the cut line, into Mvuru, and then, I don't know, I was just thinking of driving the road and seeing if I can find any on Gonzo. Okay, copy, perfect. I'll just keep checking the fire break. Um, they might have popped out north there. They, it doesn't look, I'm on Mvuru Road now, it doesn't look like they've come out here. Moment, it sounds very fresh. Uh, Ngala looks like one more daughter, Gonzo, from Ring, uh, with on uh, Gary Main. Okay, I'm going to try and puzzle out what was just said. Um, I think we might be in the wrong direction here. So while I work out, <laughs> there we go, <laughs> trying to work out how he found lion tracks on um, <laughs> Gary Main. So while we, Mike and I have a discussion, let's find out how Cheetah Plains is going. Now I hope you guys are ready to help me solve a puzzle. Because this is a serious puzzle we've got going on here at the moment. Now, there are lion tracks all over the place. There's leopard tracks and there's cheetah tracks. Now the cheetah tracks are a bit old. I think they're from a day or two ago and they've been driven over. The leopard tracks, early last night. The lion tracks are from this morning. But I've got them going in three different directions. Now, here's a beautiful one. You can see how crisp and clear they are. Now, I had tracks over there. And I think they've been hunting. And then they've been separated. Can you get these, Brian? And then here has been a joyous jumping and, and a joining up of prides and you can, or of lionesses. You can see skids, jumps, jumps some more jumps and you can see where it lands. You can't see how clear the, the track is here. So there's quite a lot going on. So just bear with me while we try to figure out the puzzle. There's tracks going this way. There's tracks jumping this way. There's another track over here. Let's have a quick look. Hopefully the bushes don't growl. Actually, hopefully they do, because then we found the lions. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, we've uh, ruled out this road. So they were playing around here. So now it's going to be, make sure they haven't gone this way. So we've got one set of tracks coming straight down the road here. Another set of tracks coming the opposite direction. Okay. So we've ruled out this way. They've only come from this way. One, two, at least two. Now I'm trying to look to see if there are any cub tracks, because this is probably the Styx Pride. But because of the drought and our close proximity to Kruger, it could be a new pride. Very much a conundrum going here. See, so here we go. We're going to turn the car around so we can keep working this puzzle out together. Hmm, very interesting. 
like a good puzzle on a Sunday morning, you know. This is my version of the Sunday morning paper. So when you guys get to the Sunday morning paper, you go, some of you I'm sure will go straight to the crossword or, or, or what are the games in the Sunday morning paper. My Sunday morning paper is trying to work out where the lines went. Okay. Now, let's think. Let's, let's just double check the wrong here. Uh, Melanie's wondering how long do the cat tracks normally stay visible in the sand? Now, it completely depends um, on how many cars or elephants or what not drive. Okay, we've got a track here of one. And she's gone. Hmm. Now, um, in this very dry climate, um, if we don't have any windy days, they can last a week. If they step in some thick mud, they can last months. But normally it's a day or two. Uh, so if we get wind or a herd of elephants or a herd of buffalo, obliterate all the tracks. Yeah, we got, we got one back. There definitely was a joyous reconnection of lionesses at that junction, although they were just playing. But just from the way we've got tracks coming from multiple directions, I think they tried to chase something and they failed. And there was happiness at, re at finding each other. So what happens here is we, we try to make sure we've cut off all the other avenues make sure we're going to go start looking in the right place so i know it was here yes this is where the old cheetah tracks are so i know there's no lion tracks on this road i've already walked and checked around here and this is where the leopard tracks also go off or was it the road before this i think it could have been the road before this brian no yeah my boot marks it's this road okay and so we've cut off north I'm not 100% sure they could have walked off in that, on that hard ground into there. But at the moment, it looks most likely that they've sort of gone southeast. Now, for me, this beats any crossword puzzle in the world. Okay, so I'm just going to go very slowly. And my head is going to be off the vehicle because I want to make sure when we see there's buffalo tracks here, maybe that's what they tried to hunt. Okay, we just going to make very, very sure that we don't miss a track through here. Hmm. Have you gone to now, I've done this before and fiddled around and looked around and then after about 10 minutes looked up and there's been a whole pile of lines sort of going what's he doing we're right here so the problem is if they cross on the hard ground Shamsung, Shamsung wants to know, are we far from where we saw all the lioness yesterday night? Yes, we're very far. Um, this will be a different pride. Okay. And some elephant, some more elephant. It always looks like they've just disappeared in <laughs> between these three roads. Okay. There's a track coming this way, so I'm just going to reverse like this so you guys can see and you can hear me while I'm 
going to have a closer look at the puzzle. Oh no, oh, and then the puzzle changes. Wow. Here is a, a lioness at full speed. You can see how much bigger the footprint is. Um, and you can see it's very indistinct because she's gone like that, sort of boom. Could be playing. Going that way, going that way. Let's see if they're not sitting on their paws watching me. Okay. Uh, Brian, let me know if I go too far. Okay, so it looks like I've got a, a good ge general direction now. I'm just going to look quickly on this big path here. Okay, but um, we've got a good general direction, so the first part of the puzzle is over. Now let's get on to the second. I think there's at least three lionesses here from the tracks I can see. And, oh, someone's on his way. I just want to have a quick word. Just because he's, if he's come from that side, he might have seen tracks there. Oh, hey. Got it. So they looks like they came and they met here and they rallied, but they go down this path going straight south. Looks like three. Did you come around this side? Okay, I'm gonna go back down towards CP Open. Perfect. So Andres is gonna give us a hand now. He's going to go check down Pipeline Road this way. We're going to go around this way. So they're pretty, should be pretty certain they're in this block here. So very exciting. And you know what? It's always nice to have a friend to help you with the puzzle. And that's what Andres and his tracker are going to do. Ooh, where's my ears gone? Ooh. I don't know how I managed to get them in the strangest places, my earpieces. Wouldn't this be exciting if it's a new pride? And I said we, we're probably only about a kilometer from Kruger and with the drought it might bring lions in because there's no water there and all the animals, the zebras and, and buffalo are going to start moving towards the water. So hopefully uh, we can find these lions and I think it'd be wonderful if they're a new pride. But while we continue to search, let's go see what Jamie's up to, bashing and crashing around on Juma. Trying not to bash and crash on Juma, but it is relatively difficult to do in this particular block. And actually, you found me. I'm sort of stuck. I've kept going until I actually can't go any further. I followed in my, I followed my old tracks in to where we had that kill, not not so long ago, a couple of weeks ago, into this thicket of strychnos. Uh, all I've heard for now is one slightly angry elephant trumpeting in the distance, maybe at lions, but I honestly don't know. And otherwise all is absolutely quiet here. But that being said, a lion could be lying 20 meters away from me in this particular patch and I would have absolutely no idea that it was here. I mean, some of the patches here are so thick you wouldn't be able to see your own hand in front of your face. And I remember distinctly being very nervous when Dave lost his pillow. No, when Dave lost Brian's pillow off the back of the vehicle during that sighting. And we had to try and rescue it before the hyenas took it back to their den site for a little bit of cushioning. I give up, I think, for now. I can't go driving any further. I've taken the road that I made before. I'm not going to go pushing in without knowing where they are, so you have to accompany me as we go back again. 
because I don't think there's any forward alternative. Actually, I'm not entirely sure I can go back. There is actually no alternative. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I've, um, I've got a little bit too enthusiastic in my off-roading and we may never actually see the road ever again. Genre, we may be stuck here for, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so while we try and make our way out of this situation, let's go back to Brent and his search for the lions. So I'm very confident that they came this way. Now the ground's a bit harder here. So it's like the, the extra long part of the cross, uh, crossword puzzle. So the sort of 20 letter word or 12 letter word. So I'm gonna have to go a little bit slower because uh, the ground's a bit harder. Make sure we don't miss a clue. Now, there is a possibility they might have killed something inside here. I saw zebra tracks running, out, running zebra tracks coming out. I'm just going to go very slowly. As you can see, the ground's quite hard here compared to where we were earlier. So, if my head is hung over the side, it's not because I'm ignoring you, it's because I want to find you some lines and figure out my Sunday morning crossword puzzle. Shamsun is wondering, would another part of Lions fight the resident prides of Lions for territory? And would the Birmingham boys help defend them? Uh, it's a very interesting question there, Shamsun. So I don't think, I think they would definitely fight for territory if they came across the sticks. Uh, but the Birmingham boys might see this as an opportunity to gather another pride of females into their harem. So it'd be a very interesting thing to say and it could go either way. Good. And that's farmer back there and then farmer now. I'll see you that side. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, that's the plan. We're going to head back to where we had those tracks and we're going to go for a walk. We are going to keep checking. They could be on the move. So that's why uh, Andres, who's helping me work out the puzzle, has gone that way and we're going to go this way. So those tracks were heading into the center of this block. And uh, so, sorry, Shamsun, back there. So I said it's, it's a very difficult thing. They might fight with those lionesses, but not for the reason to keep them out of the sort of sticks territory or, or anything like that. The reason they might fight with them is to try subjugate them to the Birmingham rule. Uh -uh. Tracks are crossing here. Gonna have a quick look. There's one set. Of, there's one track right next to me. I just want to make sure that there's more than one here, and that they haven't split. One lioness crosses there. Oh, here we go. This, they're starting the conundrum again. There's a track going that way. There's a track going that way. So I wanted to check a little bit further up the road.
Now, the reason there could be one track there and maybe another track over there is they could have been hunting. Here we go. There's the second line S, and it's a running track. So, we've solved the second part of the riddle and where they're going. Now they're heading towards that big open area on Cheetah Plains. Wouldn't it be spectacular to have lions out in that massive open area? Andres, Andres? Yeah, Andres, I've got Konzo heading south um, towards CP Open. I'm going to head that way. Hi, Melanie. Uh, Melanie would like to know how many lions are generally in a pride. Now, it all depends, Melanie. You'll probably find during this drought that the lion prides are going to increase their size. But in the Greater Kruger Park, the average pride size is between 4 and 10 uh, in this area, but can, and that's adult females, we're not counting cubs, uh, and it can go up to anything. I'm um, the mount, old mountain pride back in my Kruger Park days, it was a massive pride. There were, uh, I think there were 19 or 20 adult females. With cubs and males, they actually went over 40. So, but when a pride gets that big, it's very hard to catch enough to, to, to feed all of them. So what normally happens, they, they form splinter prides off that main pride, and then again down to that four to 10 individuals. Okay, so concentration again. Hi, miss. Uh, Miss would like to know how big on average a lion territory is. Again, it's something that completely depends on the area. In the Greater Kruger, in this particular area of the Greater Kruger, uh, normally between five and 7,000 hectares. Uh, acres times that by 2.2, which would make it, uh, let's just do well, 11,000 to sort of about 15,000 acres. Yeah, we got some impalalalas looking quite relaxed over here. And there's like, and, and Gnormless Gnormin the Gnu! I haven't seen him yet since I've been back from leave. He's been visiting other, other places. I'll show you now. I'm just going to try make sure there's not a lion sleeping out in this open area. Unfortunately, we are heading towards our southern boundary, and I'm really hoping that those lines haven't pushed all the way through. Okay, well, we're just going to go up here and I'll show, give you a quick look of a look at Gnormus Gnormen. Also, double check to make sure Gnormus Gnormen hasn't been deposed while I've been on leave, and there's a new wildebeest on this open area. He's also standing on a big animal path I wanted to check. There's Gnormus. No, it is definitely Gnormus. So Gnormus enjoying his breakfast of short grass. Now I am going to go try to solve the next part of our puzzle. And while I do that, uh, Jamie has managed to find a, a slightly easier track to drive on. I've definitely managed to find an easier track to drive on in that I found the road. But I think Brent's description of this being the equivalent of his Sunday morning crossword puzzle is probably one of the best ways that I could describe what we do. We're sort of going out playing one massive treasure hunt 
while we search for evidence. And our next clue was actually spotted by Jandre, who is scouting in a very incredible way, considering he's got to be the cameraman as well. I'm just going to fix my hat. It's been knocked askew by the, <laughs> the bumping along that we've done off-road. I'm not looking at you guys right now, and that's because Jandre found us the freshest track and we can still smell them, but I think that's Maggie we're smelling. The freshest, freshest track heading in this direction. We know that they're here. It's just such a tricky area to find them in. And we're probably going to give, not give up for now. We're probably going to leave the area for now and then return back towards the end of the sunrise safari because I'm not sure that we're going to have any luck. I think that they've gone completely flat, hidden somewhere just behind the trees. I mean, they could be, they could be right here and we're missing them totally. But Jandre did find a very perfectly fresh track heading in this direction. And they haven't, as far as we can tell, there's been about three vehicles up and down while we've been searching in there. They haven't, as far as we can tell, crossed this road. So well, I think it's time for us to, I don't think they would have come this far north. I think it's maybe time for us to leave the area, see what else we can find, particularly if Brent is on a search for lions as well. We can leave him to see if he can't solve that puzzle and at least we got to see the male, albeit very briefly, before he moved off in search of better prospects. And we'll do one last check along the fire break and then we will carry on and head towards Mufflesook Dam and Anyala Road drainage lines to see if there's any sign of the cubs, which of course... <coughs> Thank you! Excuse me! Which of course would be absolutely wonderful. Sorry. This morning for some reason with all of the dust and the, and the leaves and everything since we've been driving off road, it's made me sneeze terribly. Okay. Sounds as though Tax has had the same idea. He's also double checking the area for any leopard cubs that might, no, sorry, lion cubs or leopard cubs that might be around. They do love this block at the moment. Oh, lions. They've, in fact, I would say that 80% of our sightings in the last two weeks have been in this general area around Bubba Road, Boyatella Dam and Gari Cut Line. Even the lioness with the cubs is not far from here. Uh, while we search along, Red Red Dog has got a question about how often we see feral dogs or feral cats on the reserve and the answer is hardly ever. Since the incident with Sindile and the feral dog that managed to find its way onto Juma and onto Boetella, we I haven't seen a single one. That is the first, the second time I've ever found a feral dog in this area. So it's actually quite unusual for us to see them. They do get in. Most of them get eaten before we even realize that they're around. And the same goes for feral cats. I haven't seen any feral cats. They're not as common in the, the villages and the township areas as the stray dogs are. But there's a great deal, a number of programs geared towards sterilizing the stray dogs and cats of those areas and also obviously inoculating them against any kind or any form of disease that they might carry and be able to pass on to the local wildlife because they are a tremendous threat to both in terms of inbreeding particularly with cats and wild cats and then also in terms of their their impact in carrying being vectors of disease that the animals here might not have any kind of immunity to you got a track there I think Chandra has just picked up on a track. There's the problem with this here now is that they have been up and down this area so often. One coming in. Mm.
I've got tracks going in on this side. This is such an awkward area. Now, Melanie, while we are looking for our lions, you wanted to know, and Melanie is a new viewer from New Zealand, so she's unfamiliar with the... Oof, that's a pleasant sound. I think let's carry on. Oh, oh, yes. Melanie wants to know how we can get so close to the big cats without being attacked by them. Um, Melanie, the, the truth is that there isn't really an animal out here that wants to attack people, first of all. And we are most definitely, unless it's very, very unusual circumstances, just waving to Ephraim, unless it's very unusual circumstances, we are not on their menu. And we are particularly not in their on their menu when we are driving around in safari vehicles. Now they feel comfortable with our presence because people many, many years ago put a great deal of effort and time and effort into habituating them to the presence of vehicles. And the way that they do that with the big cats is to put up a kill or to chain it to a tree or something similar so that it can't be dragged away and then park 100 meters away or 100 feet away and put the radio on or something similar and get the get the animals slowly used to the idea of the presence of vehicle and the presence of people but now we're talking decades ago that this process played out and now we've got generations and generations of animals that have from birth been accustomed to the presence of vehicles as part of their everyday life we are as much of a reality to them as the rocks and the trees and the termite mounds and in fact, one of them, the lioness that, well, the, the, the male lion and the lioness that we saw a couple of days ago even used our vehicle in the way she might have tried to use a termite mound to hide behind and avoid the attention of the male and try and sneak around him. Basically playing a, a game of peekaboo on either side. It was the most incredible experience. It's the first time I've ever had a, a lion use my vehicle to that extent. And there's lots of stories of them using vehicles to hide behind when they're hunting. Now, it's not that we don't have an impact on their lives. We do, um, in that obviously there, there, there's a level of interaction. We, the vehicles make a noise, we, we talk around them, but it's, it doesn't bother them in any way. It doesn't change their natural behavior because they've been raised since birth to experience that. We are going to go through a bit of a signal dip here and there's nothing I can do about it. We're sort of in the middle of two signal dips. Now let us see if we can't find these lions. Last chance lions for you to pop out. I think we've moved a little bit further to further to the east. It's going to be very very tricky. And I'm just checking every single game path and so on for tracks. What's this? We cannot go any further or the signal will disappear. Um, we're going straight towards the dip of the famous black hole area of Gauri Cut Line. And what it gives us an opportunity to do, I suppose, is to have a look at the Strychnos that's in front of us, which is tricky for, for Jandre. But this is the tree that made our lives very, very difficult in this particular patch of bush. They are a bush encroacher species which grow when areas have been overutilized or overgrazed and of course this area wasn't always a conservation area although we're incredibly fortunate that it is now uh, with its very dense and it's got what is known as spines rather than thorns. So this, uh, uh, the spines are what actually create that sound as we drive through them and over them and they're quite, they're actually quite toxic plants. Uh, a couple of, maybe a couple of months ago, Eugene came to rescue us in the Mahindra from getting stuck in an art fog hole and he, one of the, the branches flicked up and caught him on the arm and scratched his arm, quite a small scratch, nothing, nothing serious. Um, and he ended up with a very, very uncomfortable secondary infection. So they're not, they're not ease, and strychnos, the name strychnos, comes from the strychnine, or that's where the name strychnine comes from, is from the strychnos plant, 
one of the cousins of our strychnos, where they derive the poison from, the strychnine poison. Okay, as we go through the signal black hole, let's find out how Brent's line search is going. Alas. Uh, we finished our crossword, and, and, and unfortunately, it's not the happiest of endings. So I'm on the Mala Mala boundary, the southern boundary of Cheetah Plains, and I've just had a chat to Andrew. He thinks this is because the Styx pride have been found further to the west of us. So this is definitely a new pride. I think we have seen them once before. They're called the Four Ways Pride, and when we saw them, it was that really long distance visual um, from the Cheetah Plains boundary when they were lying there. It was a male and a female, I think, or two females that we saw for a day or two. Um, on those big open plains. But here we go. Let me get the right side. There we go. There's one lioness. And where was the second lioness? Second lioness crossed here. Just a little bit further along. Second lioness crossed here. And then the third lioness crossed here. Oh dear. Well, at least we've finished the one crossword. So, time to go look for another crossword to figure out. And I think we're going to go have a little gander down the Mala Mala boundary. Now, quarantine crossed probably about a kilometer and a half from here. So, fingers crossed, he decided to make his way back on to Cheetah Plains. So, let's see if we can figure out the next crossword puzzle. And hopefully, uh, well, we finished this crossword, but we didn't finish it in time, so we didn't win the grand prize. So hopefully the next crossword puzzle we, 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 we take upon, uh, we'll finish the grand prize. But anyway, nice to know that we actually finished the crossword for as much as we could uh, on this Sunday morning. So I finished with the first section of the Sunday morning papers. Let's go look for the next. I did hear some elephants up ahead. Um, they sounded like they were in the south. Good morning, Eric, in Pittsburgh. And Eric is wondering what has been my favorite sighting since I started driving on Cheetah Plains. Well, Eric, I would have to say mm, it's going to be a leopard sighting. And there are two that stick out for me. The one, three, actually. Uh, and two involving Kanyini. Uh, first was when we saw her cubs and she was moving across the Kalkor open and this ray of light came out of the sky and shone upon her. That was definitely one of my, my favorite sightings. And then the second would be also with Kanyini when we were following her and she started stalking in Parla and she lay flat on that red road in the soil. That was with Brian. Uh, and then the third, ooh, was a bit difficult one, but I think it's probably uh, Shivambalan and, uh, and Quarantine having their little spat and being chased by a buffalo, and that was two days ago. But then, of course, outside of the big cats, one cannot forget the first ever live sighting of a pangolin. And that was also on Cheetah Plains. So I think those, those are my top ones. Uh, I've seen, I've had some nice lion sightings. I think it's spectacular. And I'd say those are definitely my favorites. Now, Brian and I were just chatting. I mean, I've, we've had nice cheetah sightings here, but I haven't had an, an, a, a word that has been banned in our camp unless you use it correctly.